Okay, welcome to your free GRE prep hour for September 24th, 2024. I'm Dimitri. Um, today, I want to talk to you about uh, picking numbers for math questions. Um, all the questions we're going to do today are out of our big five pound book of GRE practice problems that you can purchase for yourself. Uh, but just want to look at those as a way of getting some strategy. And specifically, what I want to talk about um, is how to pick numbers on multiple choice questions where you see either variables or percents or fractions in the answer choices. Um, there's a whole other topic of um, testing cases on quantitative comparison. We have workshops on that. Um, I also have a workshop on working backwards, which is picking numbers from the answer choices and using those to answer the question. So if you want to check out other workshops on quantitative comparison, working backwards, those are other aspects of picking numbers. But today, specifically, I'm looking at cases where we bypass some algebra by just choosing numbers to uh, to represent the unknowns of the problem. So let me look at a couple of places where this commonly happens. Um, one type is where you see um, percents or fractions in the answer choices, but it's not just any problem where you see this. It has to be a problem where there are percents or fractions in the answer choices, but there are no fixed numbers. There is no number that's actually going to turn out to be true. So in this case, it says Aloysius spends 50% of his income on rent, utilities, and insurance, 20% on food, and 30% of the remainder on video games. He has no other expenditures. Uh, we want to know what percent of his income is left, but there's no dollar amount. They never say he spends $40 on this or he has $70 remaining. So it's all just relative. It's all unknown. It's like when you see a circle inside a square, but they don't tell you any of the length and you're just trying to figure out what percent of the square the circle takes up, right? Well, then it may not matter really what the sizes of the shapes are. It's just the relative amount. Um, so in a case like this, we can simply make up a number, and I would recommend um, that you do that in, in a case like this. Um, so take a moment to try this out. I'll have you pull in your answer when you're ready. Um, so see what you can do to solve this and pull in an answer. Okay, I have most of the answers then. If you're not quite sure yet, go ahead and throw in an answer anyway, even if it's a guess, just to get in that habit. Um, okay, so um, if you picked a number here, what did you pick? What's a good number to make for his uh, his income? Yeah, if I have an unknown number and I have to take percents of it, 100 is a sensible one. There could be cases where it's bad to choose 100. Um, you'll sometimes see that if you see answer choices with hundreds in them and you've picked 100 for your number, but then it's 100 divided by 100 and it cancels itself or things like that. So there could be cases where you might be better off, say, choosing 200 or 300. But I think we're fine with 100 here. Um, the other problem would be if you chose percents. Um, if you took percents out of 100 and you end up getting a lot of decimals, and then maybe you needed, say, a multiple of three so that you could, you know, um, take a third or something like that. And so sometimes making a larger number is is valuable. But I think 100 will work here. Um, if you get in trouble, you can always double or triple your number to uh, to make it work better. Um, so I could simply, you know, sort of follow the story. I could even make little categories. I could have something like income you know, rent, utilities, insurance, food, video games, you know, extra, right, what's left. Um, so I could sort of run through it. Um, so he spent, a, he has $100. 50% of his income gets spent on rent and utilities insurance. Okay, so that's 50% of 100. The whole reason we picked 100 is that that's a nice, simple calculation. 20% on food. The one thing we have to watch when there's multiple percents, is it a 20% of the whole or 20% of the next thing that followed or 20% 20, 20 of what's left? Here, it just says and 20%. So that would imply 20% of the original. So at this point, he spent um, 
seventy dollars, right? We could kind of take these two away, and so he has thirty remaining. So then from there, I'd say, okay, he spends thirty percent of the remainder on video games. So I need thirty percent of thirty. Point three times thirty is nine dollars. And so if I take that away, um, then he has twenty-one dollars remaining. Um, and the beautiful thing about choosing 100 is that that converts directly to a percent, right? 21 over 100 is just 21%. And that's what we have. Um, so this is something where picking numbers works pretty well. It wouldn't be crazy to do uh, with decimals, although we still have to follow up the story. If I just tried to multiply a bunch of decimals together, it wouldn't work so well. So if I did decimals, I'd still have to say, you know, x minus 0.5x minus 0.2x is 0.3x. I do 30% of 0.3x, and I might just rather get rid of the x and just have it be the number 100. It's, it's simpler. It's just easier to think about. Um, I might also try narrowing it down and say, before I deal with the, the video game part, I know that he only has 30% left. And so I know he has less than 30% um, of his money remaining after this because that happens right here. Um, then I could also say, okay, it says 30% of the remainder. So it's not all the 30% of the whole. So it's not this. And so at the very least, I'd want to narrow out A and E. And I'll come back to this theme repeatedly today, that even when we're using backup strategies and even when we're not doing algebra, um, you know, there can be cases to, there's a case to be made for looking at the answers and thinking about what makes sense. Um, and in fact, I think sometimes this liberates us with a little room to do that. If we're not just stuck trying to solve an equation, we can stop and say, which of these answers make sense? Which are likely? Okay. Um, so the idea would be that anytime you see fractions or percents of some unknown whole, and there's no restraint on um, what you can make that whole, then you can just pick an easy number, pick $100 or pick, you know, 300 coins or whatever you're dealing with um, that you want to take a fraction or percent of. So I'll show you a pair of problems. Um, in this pair, one of them is going to be good for picking numbers and the other is not. Okay. So which of these numbers, uh, sorry, which of these problems would be suited for picking numbers? The top one, number 35, or the bottom one, number 42? Top, top, top. Why? What is different about the bottom one that would prevent us from picking numbers? If we look at the top one, we see that we're saying x is 0.5% of y. So that's only a relative statement. It just says whatever y is, x is, you know, half of 1% of that. Uh, and then they ask you to relate y to x. So they have one relative statement, another. The bottom one has specific amounts, right? Not only just 40 ounces, because you could maybe work with that and say, okay, of the 40 ounce, you know, um, what percents are we going to, maybe there's an unknown percent or something like that. But then they give us a 30%, which is going to be a real number. And then we have 10 more ounces. And so sure, the answers are percents of a whole, but they're percents of a given whole that has given constraints. And so this is not an appropriate one for picking numbers. Uh, that doesn't make it necessarily any harder or worse a problem than the top one, but it's not one where we want to pick numbers because there's real numbers that could be found. They just don't happen to be asking for those real numbers. They ask for a percent instead of, instead of a number of ounces. Um, so I wanted to show that as a contrast, we can't say that every time the answer is a fraction of percent, we can pick numbers. Same thing if, for instance, it was a probability question. If they say, you know, what's the chance of this or this? We can't just necessarily make up whatever numbers we want just because the answers might look like one-fifth, one-sixth, like that. Um, whereas here, I can definitely pick numbers. Um, if I want x to be 0.5% of y, what's a good... Well, first off, what's a good variable to pick for first? Should I assign a value to x first or to y first? Either way works as long as I have to, as long as I can uh, find what I want. I think it's usually probably more direct just to figure a number for Y because we're taking a percent of it. Whereas if I say, oh, X is five, then I'd have to say what number is 0.5% is, is, you know, 
what number is 5.5% of? And I might get caught up trying to think about that. So I think it's probably going to be easier to choose for Y. So if I make Y 100, then X is 0.5% of 100. Um, if you don't like that, we could say, oh, well, let's see, 0.5, well, let's see, 1% 1 of 100 would be 1. So that would be just 0.5 itself. In fact, one way to think about that, if we if we uh, do a little bit of algebra, is to say that uh, that's that 100 is 0.5. Sorry, what am I trying to say? That percent means over 100. So I could say 0.5 over 100 times 100 is just 0.5. Right? If I don't like that, if I don't want it to be y is 100, x is 0.5, I could say, OK, then y if y is 200, x will double. x will be 1. And then I just have to answer their question. I have to say, OK, y is what percent of x? Now, sometimes that's not obvious. Um, so uh, 200 is what percent of 1? Um, well, I, I can be pretty solid It's uh, that it's a large percent, right? 100% uh, of 1 is 1. 200% of 2 sorry, 200% of one is two. I'm talking too fast today. Um, so these are certainly impossible. But then is it 2,000%, 1,900%, 20,000 um, percent? How do I determine that? Glory, how did you do that? So you're saying uh, it's E, 20,000. How do we do that? If I want to know what percent 20 is of 100, um, some people will turn that into, into algebra. You can translate it very directly. You can say 200 is, is an equal sign. What is a variable? I'll use a question mark. Percent means over 100. Of means times. And you can do it like this. Um, so I just literally translated each part. 200 turns to 200. Is turns to an equ equal sign. Um, what turns into a variable? Percent turns into over 100. Uh, time Of is times and y is 1. Uh, or sorry, well, 1 is 1. Okay. Um, I can also just divide and multiply by 100, which is what I end up doing, right? When I, when I want to find question mark, I, I end up dividing by 1, which is trivial, right? Dividing by one does nothing, right? But if if x had been, say, 2 or 3 or 0.5, I need to divide by that. I'm going to multiply by 100. And so I end up with 200 times 100. This question mark, right? So that's 20,000. A general way I can do it without setting up an equation is just in general, when I want to find what percent something is of something else, I just divide and multiply by 100, which is what someone's saying in the comment, y over x over 100. So I could just say, hey, 200 divided by 1 times 100 is 20,000 percent. Okay. Um, so that's that's the idea of, you know, how I could set this up. But picking numbers still, even though I did a little bit of algebra at the end, picking numbers still, you know, made this a bit easier to think about, perhaps. Um, I can also, when I'm thinking about percents, I can I can start with what I did earlier, which is what's 100 percent of one? 100 percent of one is one. So then what's 200 um, percent of one? That's two. Okay. What's, uh, then what would 20 be? Well, it's 10 times as big. That's 2,000%. So what would 200 be? Another 10 times as big. That's 20,000%. Okay. So this is a common situation that we'll see, that we see answers that have fractions or percents of some unknown number, and you just pick values for that unknown number. Um, this could even happen when I have something like say, a rates and work problem. This is a bit harder problem for many people, um, but it still has in common that it says, you know, hey, Jenny takes three hours to sand a picnic table. What's unknown is how much work is that? How many square feet is the picnic table? How large is it, you know? Um, sometimes it doesn't even say something like sand a picnic table. Sometimes it just says to do a job, and then that job could be to sand five tables. It could be to, you know, dig 20 ditches. It could be to drive a certain number of miles. We don't know what the job is. Here, they've defined the job as one thing, but we can make up a number to quantify that still. 
right? Um, Layla can do the same job in half an hour. So for a rate and work problem, we can often set up a, a charter table where we say, okay, rate times time equals work. And the idea would be that if I know their times, I could put in uh, a job like, you know, one table. And I know that since rate times time equals work, work divided by time equals rate. So I could do, for instance, one third table per hour for Jenny and uh, two tables per hour for Lila, which is a little deceptive if we don't write it down. We might see the half and think she works very slow when in fact she works very fast. Um, and so we could do it this way. But we might benefit from making up a job so that I can avoid fractions. Partly, it's it's funny with my with my job because I often find that I spend a lot of my day teaching people how to do algebra and how to work with fractions, which I think are very valuable human inventions, and I'm very happy to teach them. But I also spend a very large part of my day trying to help people avoid algebra and fractions. And basically, my thinking is: yes, you want to be able to do those things, but you also don't want to have to do them more than necessary. It's kind of like, I want you to have enough money to buy the things you need, but I also want you to be able to do some things that don't cost any money. And I want you to save money where you can, right? If I can uh, if I can make dinner tonight without having to spend a lot of money, then I might like to do that. But I'd also like to be able to pay for dinner if I have to. And that's how I think about things like algebra. I want to be able to do it, but I don't want to have to do it. I want to have other ways. Um, uh, here I can make up a task. Um, and so what would be a good task to do? Instead of calling it one table, what if I said, like, for instance, a number of square feet or a number of units that, that she's going to complete, right? What would be a good number to put in for the work with my goal of not actually having fractions, at least not till the end? I just need something that three and one half can go into. So I could just make my number three, right? Um, I could, if I don't like using one as a rate, I could use two. Maybe I'll call this six square feet. So maybe the table is is a giant six square feet of sanding that you have to do. And so we'll just say, okay, well then Jenny is gonna be gonna be doing two square feet per hour. And Layla, six divided by one half is going to be doing 12 square feet per hour. At this point, how do we answer the question that they asked? We want to know how long they take together. What do I need to do? If these aren't the most comfortable uh, general practice, but these is you want to think about when people are working together, um, that you add their rates. So to, between the two of them, instead of having to add fractions like, um, you know, something with a third, or I think we had uh, well, we had two and we had uh, a third, which is not the hardest fraction you've ever done. But here I have a nice integer. And then I just say, okay, what's the job? And so the time is going to be work divided by rate, which is going to be six fourteens which is three sevenths. So I could have just put in three all along. I just wanted to show you that it produces pretty well. So is this easier than the other way you do it with the fractions, for instance? Not necessarily. Um, it's more that I want to introduce this as a tool as an, and as an option. And there are some cases where you might find it a lot easier. Um, so the idea would be that if you see a, a problem where there's some quantity you're dealing with or taking fractions of or taking multiples of, and we never need to know the quantity, um, and we're not going to find out the quantity at any point, then we can make up that quantity. We can even replace something that seems like a given quantity, like one table, right? Or one carton of juice with some number of units. How many ounces is a carton? How many square feet is a table? Or I can just change it to something else. I can just call it their, I don't know, they're making six things and forget the table entirely because the math is not going to care about that, you know, that table. Right? Um, okay. 
I think we could also have seen that um, some of these answers are not super likely. Um, there's one answer in particular that we can rule out before we've calculated really anything. Right? If Jenny could do a job in three hours and Lila can do the same job in half an hour, what do we know immediately about the time they take that would get rid of one of these answers before I do any calculation at all? Okay, I'm seeing to get rid of A. Okay, why A? And we certainly can get rid of all of them. The, the first one I had in mind was E. And the reason I would say E is that's longer than Lila takes on a row. L can finish on her own before that. So E is actually strictly impossible. Of course, all of the answers are impossible once we calculate, but E is impossible even without us calculating. We just know that that's, that's too far. Um, we could also say, yeah, really interesting, right? Uh, well, no, the time isn't going to be in between three and one half. And in fact, this number is not in between three and one half. Three sevens is a little bit less than one half, right? Um, you have to think of time and, and rate as kind of... Um, inverses of each other. So when they work together, their rates go up, but their times go down. Um, so what you could really put it in between would be, imagine that there were two Jennies or imagine there were two Lilas. If, there, if Jenny could do a job in three hours, two of her could do a job in 1.5 hours. And if Lila could do a job in half an hour, two of her could do a job in one quarter of an hour. And so what, what I know about the two of them together is that they're going to take somewhere in between one and a half hour, which is not very interesting, and uh, 0.25 hours. But we've already seen more than that because we know um, Lila is so much faster than Jenny. We actually know that they're going to get done in less than a half an hour, but more than a quarter hour. And so these numbers are too small because they're less than a quarter. A third is in theory plausible. A third is not very far from three sevenths, right? Um, uh, three sevenths is uh, is right about 0.42, and one third is like 0.3, is point repeating three. They're not so far apart. We can prove that D is right, of course, um, but uh, it would be a little harder to establish that uh, that C is wrong without without getting further. But sometimes narrowing the answers down um, is a great way to get a sense of, first off, what you might do to solve the problem. And second, um, whether your answer is right once you have it. I think the more suspicion you have of what, what the answer ought to be, the more often you catch your mistakes. I make plenty of mistakes, um, but I tend to catch them on the test. Um, not without fail, but but most of the time, if I make a mistake, I catch it or somehow get around it because I have multiple things telling me what kind of answer to expect. And so I encourage you to, to work on that and develop that. Okay, so this is one common prompt of where we can pick numbers when we're seeing fractions or percents of an unknown whole, an unknown whole. Another um, common situation is when you see variables and the answer choices. And the idea here is they're often going to say, they don't use the phrase here, but they'll often be saying, in terms of some variable, express some other amount. Here, we don't even bother. We just say a bag of snack mix has three ounces of pretzels, the fixed numbers, you see, not like the last one where the numbers were all, uh, you know, percents of fractions, real numbers, three ounces, one ounce, two ounces. Um, but then we have X ounces of dried fruit, and we want to know what percent of the mix is dried fruit. Um, so we're basically looking for fruit over total. And so certainly we can express this algebraically. And in fact, you might prefer to express this algebraically and that's absolutely fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing the algebra on this problem. And if you feel comfortable with it, um, you might do that very quickly. But I wanna show you that you can do it with picking numbers. Um, and so one thing that's interesting here is I might say, well, what else is there? If I say, you know, pretzels plus chocolate plus nuts, that's three plus four is six ounces. So what would be an easy amount to pick for the fruit so that the fraction would be easy to calculate? Well, 
What if I just made the fruit six ounces too? So that I could say, okay, so I don't even have to calculate at this point. I could just say, so it's 50% uh, fruit. Okay, so I want an answer that's going to give me 50. That's my target. When you pick numbers um, and the answer is in terms of something, and a key, a key thing you have to do is identify your target, which is always just the answer to the question. Just use your numbers to answer the question. So we want a target of 50 where X equals six. A key thing here is then that you have to check all the answer choices because sometimes more than one might work and you don't have to change your numbers or adjust or see what makes sense. Um, but you don't really care what the answers are. You just care if they reach your target. So if I look at six over 600, it's not too hard to figure out that that's um, one over 100 or 0 0.01, but I don't need to calculate as long as I know that isn't going to be 50. If the top is smaller than the bottom, it's not going to be 50. Um, here, I have 100 over 6x, so 100 over 36. Um, again, I could try to calculate that, but if I know that it's you know maybe a little less than three, I don't actually care what it is. I'll get rid of that one. Um, this one will be 100x over 6, so 600 over 6. Well, I know what that is. That's 100. It's not what I want. Here I have 100x, 600, over 6 plus x, over 12. Huh, that's more plausible. I know that 600 divided by 10 is 60, so 600 divided by 12 could be right. If you know what that is, great. You might call this um, 100 over 2, which is 50, or you could just punch it into your calculator. That's 50. Um, but I would still check uh, answer choice E, but I think we can really quickly verify that if I take 6 and divide that by 100 times 12, that is not going to be 50, and I do, do not care what it actually is. Right? It's just not 50. So I can pick it this way. So again, do I have to do the problem this way? Maybe you think this is an easy algebra problem. And if you do, then you know you you wouldn't do it this way necessarily. Um, but I think it's a good part of your review to try multiple paths, even if you didn't need it, right? Maybe you looked at this problem, you did the algebra, you got it right in 35 seconds. Fantastic. So why would you even think about picking numbers? Well, in your review, you'd look at it and say, is that an option? How could I tell? Does it take longer? Does it take shorter? Is it useful? And that's just part of your training. You get a better and better sense of which one would have worked. And that's like anything you might do. Maybe you make a financial decision, like you buy or sell a stock and it works out well for you. You know, you make money on the, on, on the decision, but you might look back and say, and what would have happened if I hadn't, right? Um, in fact, that's part of what it means to say you made money on it, right? If I sell a stock today and I recoup, you know, I, I, I pick up a, you know, 20% gain or so, um, what happened after I sold it? Did it tank and I'm so glad I sold it? <laughs> uh, did it go up another 140% and I'm kicking myself, right? So I'm always looking at those options and saying, what else might have happened? Um, and I think that's part of, of getting stronger at this test. But that way also, if you can if you can master a technique on a problem that you don't think is hard, then you're more likely to have it available to you on a problem that you do think is hard. But if you only practice these sort of backup techniques on problems where you're overwhelmed, um, then it's much harder to, um, to have them ready when you need them. One other thing that I think could be interesting um, to look at is uh, positional analysis of the answers. And I, I, I tend to push people about this just again to get a better sense of where the answers ought to go. Um, it's interesting, uh, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'm gonna leave the answer marked just for clarity. Um, and just for our purposes, it might be interesting to know where X shows up. So on some of the answer choices, X is only on the top. In other answer choices, X is only on the bottom. One time it's being uh, multiplied, and another time it's being uh, added to something that then gets multiplied. Um, but okay, that one's not just on the bottom, right? So then in in uh, two other choices, it's on both, right? Uh, so sorry, I should mark it this way, green, green. And so it's interesting, we have two answers where X is on the top, one where it's on the bottom and one where it's in both. Um, and I might be drawn away, say from D and E, if I thought, well, I don't wanna have X in two places, I would just simplify it. But it actually doesn't simplify very well in these cases. Um, so why is this valuable? I might look at, well, when X goes up, if there's more fruit, what happens to the percent of the mix that's fruit? Um, 
it seems like the more fruit there is, the greater percent fruit there should be. And so I think in some ways, the worst answer might be B. B implies that we're simply divided by X, which means that the more fruit you have, the lower the percent. That's pretty weird. I don't want that. This is saying the more fruit, fruit, the lower the percent fruit. That can't be right. Um, A and C make a bit more sense because they're saying, okay, the more fruit, the higher the percent fruit. This seems is better. Um, we could worry about the, where the percent is. For instance, maybe I want the percent on the top since I'm turning a fraction into a percentage, usually I'd multiply as we saw earlier. And so I could say narrow down by that placement. Hey, I don't want the hundred on the bottom uh, on the bottom. And if I did that, that would get me down to just two answers. Um, so then the question is, why is the X on the top and the bottom? This is an interesting trap because it's the same trap that sometimes occurs to people if they do the algebra. Some people will simply do fruit over all the rest, right? Like X over six, um, and then they'll multiply that by 100, and they'll get C. But this is wrong, because they didn't ask how the fruit compares to the rest. They asked how fruit compares to the total mix, and the total mix includes the fruit. And so this is a common thing when you add um, something into some, to a mix, or you increase a group, is that it increases its share, but it also increases the entire size. It's like if I said, um, what percent of people in my city um, are immigrants, let's say. And let's say right now, 20% of the people in my city are immigrants. And then we get 10,000 new immigrants. Well, do we just increase the numerator by 10,000? No. Sure, there's 10,000 new immigrants. We add that to the number of people in the top. But the city also, that therefore, has 10,000 more people. We add it to the bottom as well. So any case where you're, where you're adding something into an existing mix... Uh, or increasing one part of a mix, even if the rest was already there, um, you end up increasing the top and the bottom. And we can look to expect that whether we're doing algebra or um, picking numbers. Okay. So let's look at a couple of other cases where um, I can uh, I can pick some numbers, but where I might also use a bit of uh, positional analysis to figure out what goes where. Okay, let's try this one. I'll just give you one to pull in when you're ready. Okay, so pull this one in, even if you're not sure. Um, but uh, this is one where it uh, looks like uh, might be taking people a little longer. It's normal. Um, and uh, we could get a little more thrown about what we're supposed to do algebraically. And that's why I think it's so valuable to just make up some numbers, right? If I just say, okay, if the taller tree, I'm going to draw two very beautiful trees, okay? Here's one tree, and here's another tree. Okay. 
And the taller tree is X times the height of the shorter tree. I could make up an X, right? For instance, I could say maybe X is three. And then I could just say, okay, so then this would be some height, right? This would be like, say, the shorter height. And this is three times the shorter height. And they have to add up to 60. I don't think that would be too crazy to do. Um, if I want to make life even easier, I could just make up tree heights. I could just say, I don't know, um, they add up to 60. Let me make this 10 and this 50. Um, okay, and now I know what X is. X would have to be 5. So either way is fine, right? If it had been three, I would have had to just back solve and say, okay, something plus three times that is 60. Um, oh, let's see, what is that? That's 15 and 45. But that's just a slight amount more work I would have to do. Um, so here I could just say 10 and 50. So then I say, how tall is a shorter tree in terms of X? So with X being five, my target is the height of the shorter tree, which is 10. So I want to look for an answer that gets me 10. So if I do, let's see, what is this? 60 over one plus X. Oh, let's see, 60 over six. Oh, that looks like 10. Let me just make sure none of the others work. 60 divided by five is 12. Okay, no. Um, and if I just saw that 60 over five will be, um, you know, more than 10, that's enough. Um, 30 divided by five, definitely not, uh, definitely not 10. 60 minus 10. Okay, that sounds like the height of the taller tree. And then 30 minus 25, that's too small. So I'm done. Here we could also then look back and benefit from hindsight to think about why we have what we have on the bottom. Um, that we have x on the bottom. Now, to some extent, it makes sense for x to be diminishing the value, but they all do that. Either they divide or they subtract. And it makes sense then that the more tall the, the tall tree is in comparison to the short tree, the smaller the short tree will be. So it makes sense that we would make, uh, when X gets bigger, the answer would get smaller. But that's true for all of them. They're all either dividing by X or subtracting X. So it's less obvious in this case, um, without some more work, why A would work particularly algebraically. We can do a bit of algebra. We could say, you know, the short equals S and the tall equals XS. And so then I could do something like algebraically like this, short plus tall is 60. I could pull the short out and solve for short, and I get this answer. And so it's good to be able to do the algebra, uh, but sometimes picking numbers just saves us that trouble, right? I don't have to be creative. I don't have to think of this. I just pick numbers. It's a different kind of creativity, I suppose you could say. Okay, so there are a lot of there are a lot of cases in which you can make your life a little easier um, if you simply make up some numbers. It gets a little less um, a little less need for uh, for writing a lot of equations or or feeling like you have to come up with some amazing strategy. It can just be a, a way in. Okay, um, so let me give you uh, two other cases. I'll give you a minute to do these. Uh, as a pair, so I'll probably check in with about in about three minutes. What I'll ask you to do is uh, just pull in A when you're ready to discuss both. But we'll probably check in in about three minutes. So give these a try.
Okay, so let's look at this pair. Um, a lot of people get immediately overwhelmed when there's multiple variables all connected. Louise is three times as old as Mary, and Mary is twice as old as Natalie, and blah, 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 and something's L. Um, so sure, we'll need to find out what L is, but we might not want to start there, right? I could say, um, let's see, Louise is 10. Okay, that's three times as old as Mary. Oh, no, Mary's 3.33. I don't want that. Okay, Louise is 30. She's three times as old as Mary, and that's fine to do. Or I could just go the other way. I could just start with Natalie. I could say, hey, just because she doesn't get a variable doesn't mean that I don't have a value for her. So I could say, I don't know, Matt, Natalie's five. And okay, Mary's twice as old as Natalie. Mary's 10. So there's nothing wrong with starting with Louise. I would just have to be clear in what I'm doing. And so sometimes it's easier to start smaller and build up. Mary's twice as old as Natalie. Louise is three times as old as Mary. Um, and so Louise is going to be 30. Sometimes they'll trick you with wording. They'll say things like three times as old as Mary and twice as old. So then Louise is twice as old. Other times they might say three times as old as Mary, who is twice as old. And then Mary is twice as old. And so we have to watch exactly who's twice as old as whom. But this would be their idea, our idea. So if, uh, if Louise is 30 years old, I want the average. I could say, okay, so the average is just the total divided by the number of people. So what do I have? 45 over 3. So my average age is 15, which kind of checks out. I have uh, two that are lower and one that are higher. Well, that's quite a bit higher than 15. Um, and so I want uh, that, that as my answer. My target is 15 and my L is 30. So I'm looking for this target with a value of L of 30. Here, I don't really have to test all the answers because they're all different fractions of 30. So I can just say, huh, a third of 30 is 10. A half of 30 is 15. Great. Two thirds of 30 is 20, a fourth of 30 is, you know, well, 7.5, which is weird. Uh, but I suppose an average can be a, a fraction, it just wasn't. Um, or a six of 30 is five. So yeah, they're all different fractions of, of 30. I don't have to calculate them. Okay. Um, for the second one, they've told me these are consecutive integers. So that constrains them quite a bit, but that just means I can choose any consecutive integers. Um, what, if you picked some, what did you pick? Oh, sorry, I mean, in terms of numbers, right? It, there, and there's nothing wrong with just starting from the bottom. Uh, no, I'm, when I'm saying pick, I, you could pick numbers, right? I could say, hey, one, two, three, four. And so if I want to know the average of these in terms of D, when D is four, I could say, okay, so the average equals total over four. Seven, eight, nine, ten equals ten fourths, which is 2.5. And so with a with a D value of four, I want to get an answer of 2.5. So I have four minus 2.5, no, four minus two, four minus 1.5. Oh yeah, that looks like that works. Uh, four plus something, no, no, I don't want to add. E looks messy, but let me verify. 16 minus six over seven, that is not going to be two and a half. That's going to be... 10 sevens, whatever on earth that is, one point something. Um, and so I get rid of those, those, and choose C. Okay. Um, and here's one where I definitely could get rid of something like D even at a glance. If I want to know the average, the average has to be less than the biggest number. It can't be more than the biggest number. Um, and so that might be a way to, to you know narrow down a bit. Okay, great. Um, we have time to do a few more. I thought we could look at how you'd apply this to um, some geometry questions. And so um, when you see a shape, you can certainly draw a picture to hold all your values in. And that's one nice thing. When I'm doing something like a rate and work problem, or a percent change problem, I might set up a table you know, with the equation or with um, before and after. If I have something like a rectangle or a hexagon or something, I can just draw it and, and put my values in there. Um, so try this one out. Um, it's certainly something we could do with algebra. Uh, but you might be happier putting in some numbers. So try to just draw a rectangle, put some numbers in that fit what they told us, and see what you find. Uh, pull it in when you have it.
Okay, so let's see what we can do with this. Uh, looks like this one wasn't super easy, um, but let's uh, let's put some numbers to it and see if we can make it nicer. So um, if I draw a rectangle, and fun fact about rectangles, when they talk about length and width, there's no defined meaning of length versus width. It's just two dimensions. So you can call whichever one you want length and which one you want width. I tend to call the one on the floor the length and the one going up the width or the height, depending. Um, but you can call it what you want. Um, but I know, okay, if this is the length and I know the width is twice the length, oh, then I haven't drawn it very well, have I, right? Because now it looks like the width is half the length. So guess what I could do? I could just change how I, how I label them. Now I'll call this the length and this the width. It's the same thing. Don't get too crazed about it, right? They're just two dimensions of the same thing. Just turn your head. Um, so I want the width to be twice the length. So I'll just make up some numbers. All right. Um, and I can make up uh, whatever numbers I want, really. Um, there are some numbers I could put in that might have funny answers I can talk about, but if we just to make things simple, what if I just said the width is, the length is five and the width is 10? Uh, they said the perimeter is P. Okay, the perimeter is the sum of all the sides. You might know that it's twice the length plus twice the width. You could just think about it as 10 and five and 10 and five. Okay, so the perimeter is 30. And the area is length times width, so the area is 50. And so these are our two things. Our target is 50. That's our area. And the value you're plugging in for P is 30. Uh, now, the problem with the number I chose, numbers I chose is they made the perimeter kind of large. And then when I square it, it's a little annoying. But you might already know that 30 times 30 is 900. If you don't, you can. this is calculator city. But I would just have to say, hey, is this going to get me 50? So here I'll have 900 over 18, which I might call uh, 100 over 2, right? um, which would be 15. Okay. Um, this would be the exact same thing, but divided by 36. So it would be tw half of it. It would be 25. Here I have P over 9, 30 over 9. That's not going to go in nice. Uh, 900 over 9 will give me 100. And P over 6. 30 over 6 will just be 5, right? Um, so A it is. Uh, earlier, I was playing with this, and I chose the numbers 3 and 6. I just wanted to show you a brief take on that. Um, if I had chosen to make the length 3 and the width 6, I would still get the right answer. But I might be a little confused, uh, because I'd say, OK, then the perimeter is going to be 3 plus 6 plus 3 plus 6 is 18. And the area is going to be 3 times 6. It's going to be 18 also. And so that might put me off. Am I right about that? Are they really the same? Well, it happens that at this level, they are the same. But that won't change the answer. Um, you can even look at A as, OK, I want, I want to plug in. My target's 18, but my P is also 18. So if I just say, hey, what's 18 times 18 over 18? Well, guess what? <laughs> it's 18. It still works out. Whereas if I have 18 times 18 over 36, that's half of 18, that's nine, et cetera. So I, I can still do it even though it might like make me nervous that I have those particular numbers. Okay. Let's close with one more, one more that might be a little interesting for you um, because I want to talk again about uh, position. Um, oh, it's one, one other thing It's not too surprising that since uh, perimeter is a linear measure, and area is a uh, two-dimensional measure, it's maybe not very surprising that the right answer has a P squared in it, right? Um, that these squares are a good sign that we're getting from a linear measure to a 2D measure. So if I had to guess on one like this, I'd guess one that had P squared, and it makes sense it's on top. The bigger the perimeter, the bigger the area. It wouldn't You wouldn't want it on the bottom if that were a thing. Um, whoops, across all the wrong ones. Uh, this and this would be out. OK. Let's do one more question while we have the moment. You might feel that you don't have all the knowledge of the formula for this. So one thing you might think about if you're stuck, if you feel like, hey, I can't, even if I pick numbers, I can't do I can't do this out. You might think about what I expect to happen with the A, B, and C. When A, B, and C get bigger, should X get bigger or smaller? Right? Um, they're asking for X. So if when A, B, and C get bigger, x also gets bigger, then you'd expect to add a, b, and c in, and I'd expect the answer to be a or b. If when a, b, and c get bigger, x gets smaller, then I'd expect to subtract a, b, and c, and I'd expect it to be c, d, or e. So something to think about. 
Um, I'll give you a little moment to try it. Pull it in when you're ready. Okay, so let's talk about this one. Um, it definitely requires some knowledge about polygons, and you know, it's not super obscure knowledge, but it's certainly something that if you haven't studied this in a while, you might not know. Um, so I might think about how X relates to the rest. Um, for instance, I might know that X plus, let's say I call this angle here. Ah, uh, hold on. My tools go here. Let's say I call this angle here F. I might know that F and X add to 180. And so the smaller F is, the bigger X is. And then I might have to think about how a F relates to A, B, C, D, and E. When A and B and C, D, and E get bigger, what happens to F? If all the other angles in the shape get bigger, then F gets smaller, right? Yep. And if F gets smaller, when F gets smaller, X gets bigger. So the bigger A, B, C, D, E are, the bigger X is. Now, why am I saying that? Because that allows us to get down to just two choices. Look at C, D, and E. We talked about this at the beginning. In C, D, and E, when A, B, C, D, E get bigger, X gets smaller. They're asking for X in terms of A, B, C, D, E. A, B, C, D, uh, C, D, and E here are saying that the bigger these numbers are, we're subtracting them. So the bigger they are, the smaller my answer is. Whereas A, B, and C, we're saying we're adding them. Um, B has it only in terms of A, B, and C, and advantages to avoid numbers where a has a number in it, so you can make your guess on which one is more likely. But that's a way you can narrow this down without doing any um, significant math, just sort of thinking about how these pieces connect. If I am going to do this out, I can do algebra, certainly, but I might want to avoid the algebra. I, I just need to know how many degrees are in um, what we have here, which is what a hexagon, right? It's got six sides. And so the rule of thumb is a triangle has, three, has 180 degrees. 
uh, a rectangle or any other quadrilateral has 360 degrees. Uh, and then for each extra side, it's plus 180. So the formula says that, you know, total degrees equals 180 times n minus 2, where n is the number of sides. And so if I had to do something like imagine a shape with 32 sides, you know, how many degrees are in it? Okay, 30 times 180. Um, but for a small number of sides, I might kind of keep it concrete to say, well, if it were a rectangle, it would have 360. If it were a pentagon, it would have 360 plus 180. If, there is, if it's a hexagon, it's going to have 360 plus 360. So it's going to be 720 degrees. And so then I could just sort of make up some some values, right? I could sort of do them as an average. I could just say, huh, well, let's see, divided by six, that'd be 120. So the average size will be 120. Now that might seem kind of cheap, right? To make them all the same, but well, why not? What if I just call A120 and B120? I don't have to write it somewhere. I just put it in my picture. I'll draw the picture very loosely. I'm not going to draw it very nicely because I'm bad at drawing and I don't have time, um, but I'll make all these 120 and then I'll just follow what they said for the others. D is 2C. Oh, that's 240. Oh, is I'm, am I going to get in trouble? Did I make my numbers too big? Let's see. E is 1 half A. Well, thank goodness, because otherwise I'm going to run out. So let me make sure I have this, that it still works, right? Okay. 120 plus 120 is 240. Another 240 is 480, 500, 600, 660. Oh, thank goodness. I have 60 degrees left. It's a bit repetitive, but it's fine. Um, so then uh, X has to add to 180 with this. So X will be 120. And so I'll just say, all right, my target is 120. Um, what I can do, since they both require me to calculate three halves A plus B plus three C, I'll just figure that out. And if it's 120, then great. And if it's not 120, then um, it's A. And I don't have to calculate the others because even if they somehow worked, they couldn't always work. It couldn't always be true that the bigger A, B, and C got, the smaller X would be because that's the opposite of what we found out. So I just say, okay, three halves of A. That's 180 plus B is 120 plus 3C is uh, 360. Okay, what is that? That's 660. Okay, that's definitely not 120. Whereas if I did 660 minus 540, that would be 120. Yeah, that'll get it. But I don't have to do all the calculations. So again, I'm always trying to save myself work. I don't want to be lazy and sloppy, right? Sometimes I use the word lazy in a positive sense, as in I don't want to do more work than I have to. But I don't want to really just skip steps that I need. I want to avoid doing work that I don't need to do because I don't always need to verify. I have enough information to verify already. And the more a sense I have about what makes sense, the more I can save myself work. So taking a moment at the beginning to think about why C, D, and E don't make sense, now save me the trouble of having to check and see if either of C or if any of C, D, or E also give me an answer of 120, which they don't anyway. Um, okay, so um, I'll stop this one there, but I think it's definitely worth, uh, you know, playing with some of these constraints like this and playing with this idea of picking numbers where it's valuable to you. So common themes for when to pick numbers, um, variables in the answer choices, percents are fractions of some unstated and unfindable uh, whole. Um, and then uh, in other workshops, we talk about working backwards from the answers, picking those numbers, or testing cases in a quantitative comparison to see which column is larger. So those are other areas where you might also pick numbers. It's a pretty big theme on the test. Um, I will stop us there. Um, you can stick around if you have any questions for me. I'd also encourage you to check out one of our courses. You can check out class one of any of our courses for free um, and see if it works for you. Um, thanks so much for coming by. Uh, I hope this is helpful and best of luck with your test.